I'd like you to take the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians tonight, chapter 4. We'll read the first few verses together to begin. Tonight I'd like to talk a little bit about our vessels. Our vessels. All of us has a vessel that we're put in charge of. And, uh, but let's read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians starts really a new section, a new, a new section of the book, and he starts to talk about practical things, our practical walk, before that, it was about mostly about uh, uh, him praising them for the things that God had done in their lives already. But here he, he starts a new, a new theme, talking about the believer's walk and his hope. And, uh, but there's a key word here, and that key word uh, is one of the key words of the book of 1 Thessalonians. And that word is the word sanctification. Sanctification. You'll see it there in verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And then in verse 4 again, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So we're supposed to be vessels of sanctification and honor. That's what we're supposed to be. And so tonight I want to talk about us as vessels of sanctification. What does that mean? And how can it help us tonight in a practical way? Well, a vessel is something that you use to put something inside of. And the Bible says that man is like a vessel. He created, he created us, he created man in the Garden of Eden as a vessel. But what? Uh, and, he, and he poured into man all sorts of wonderful things. He created man in his own image, the image of God. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. But we're created as vessels, but what, what are we supposed to hold as vessels? Uh, vessels hold things, don't they? Well, God wants us to hold him, his, Himself. We're vessels. We're, the Bible says also in another, another place that we're temple. If you're a Christian, you're a temple of the Holy Ghost. And yet, uh, man fell into sin. Man became uh, empty. Man became empty of the things that they're supposed to have. Man, man became sinful and marred, a marred vessel, a broken vessel. And so once we're saved, once we're saved, that, that emptiness, that, that vacuum, so to speak, uh, that is in every man, God created us with a God-shaped vacuum, and then God fills that again with himself. And, uh, but yet... We were supposed to be pure vessels. We're supposed to be holy vessels that are set apart. As Christians, God has filled us. He's given us so much. And yet, he says there's an important thing to remember, though. We need to know how to possess our vessel with sanctification and with honor. As a Christian, we're supposed to be sanctified. Okay, this word sanctification, it's a big word, but it means set apart. We're supposed to be set apart vessels, sanctified vessels. In the Old Testament, uh, by the way, uh, I'm st I, in this uh, Old Testament survey. Uh, I've really been enjoying it. But um, tomorrow night, I'm going to be teaching about the book of Leviticus, and the the, key, the main key word in Leviticus is the word holy, holiness. And it talks all through the book about holiness of the Lord. And all these things that God set up in the tabernacle were supposed to be set apart things, holy things, for the Lord's use. But in the book of Exodus, which Mr. Pavitt taught about this past week, um, in Exodus, the children of Israel left Egypt. They left Egypt. They were 
God rescued them. They, they made the great exodus from Egypt in the book of Exodus. And when they made the exodus from Egypt, uh, they didn't just go out, uh, but, the, but the Egyptians were so ready to get rid of them, they just showered gifts on them. They said, here, take this gold, take all these gifts, just get out of here, go as fast as you can. And so they brought all this spoil with them from Egypt. So here comes this, this gold that had been used for wicked things in Egypt in the, in the temples of other things, uh, other gods. And so this gold from Egypt, G God said, okay, use that gold. Everybody give of that, all that stuff. Give it to Moses. Give it to Aaron. And we'll make these new vessels to be used in the tabernacle. And these vessels, even though they're from, e even though they're, they're, they're from Egypt, I can use them. I can use them in my service. They can be vessels that are sanctified, that are set apart for God's use. You know, we, as people, we, we were used to be, spiritually speaking, in Egypt. We used to be living our lives for the world, living our lives for ourselves. But God saved us. He brought us out. He, he rescued us. The Exodus is a picture of God's salvation. He saved us. And uh, then, then now he wants to set us apart, sanctify us, so he can use us, so he can use us for his glory. So, that's the introduction tonight. We should be vessels of sanctification. We should be set apart. But what, what does that word sanctification mean? And so I want to go through the book of 1 Thessalonians and just talk about some things that Paul uses in this book. And the main theme of the book is, of this part of the book is sanctification being set apart, growing. But what does that mean in a practical way in the lives of these Thessalonians? The first thing is, <clears throat> number one, sanctification comes after conversion. Sanctifi san sanctification is something that happens after you've been converted or after you've been saved. Look at chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians and verse number 9. Chapter 1, verse 9 says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So they had already been saved. They had turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They'd been saved. The word justification, when you're justified, that's when you get saved, right? Right? But then sanctification comes after that. That's when, as, that after you get saved, you, you're justified. So sanctification comes after you're saved, after you become a Christian. Now, after you become a Christian, you're supposed to be set apart. But you're supposed to be set apart from the world. You know, we live in a wicked world. And as God's people, we are the set apart ones that are supposed to show people who God is. And we're, we, have a, we have a great job, a great testimony that we could have. But, look here, look, at, look here at the order of chapter 1, verse 9. It says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So when you get saved, it's not turning your back on all these worldly things so much. I mean, we are supposed to turn our back on worldly things, but the focus, that's not the focus. The focus is turning to the Lord and from the world. You know, we can't just tell people, well, give up all your old stuff. That's not what sanctification is all about. It's not just about giving up things. It's turning to the Lord, and then all those other things fall away naturally. To the Lord from idols. That's the order. So sanctification comes after conversion. The gospel had... Now, just to give you the background of 1 Thessalonians, the gospel had come to these people. The gospel had come, verse 8 says, that it came with much affliction. And uh, it says that uh, it came also um, with much contention. Chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, at the end of the verse, it says, um, In our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So, Paul and Silas, they had gone to Thessalonica. And you can find the story if you want to later on in Acts chapter 17. They had gone to Thessalonica and they had preached the gospel to these people. They had gotten <coughs> saved. They were there for a few weeks, about three weeks. And then uh, they had taught them all these wonderful truths. In just three weeks, Paul taught them so many great truths. And he's able uh, to write to them about so many great truths that he taught them in those three weeks. 
Then uh, the, 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 the Judaizers came in. They, they started stirring up strife in the synagogue. They, they, uh, they were meeting in Jason, this man named Jason's house. They, drug J they dragged Jason to the big amphitheater and they were shouting and screaming and yelling. And, they, they were, and so Paul and Silas had to leave town right after that. And pretty quickly. And so, because they had to leave so quickly, Paul's concerned about these Thessalonians. They'd heard the gospel, they had turned to the Lord, they'd left their idols behind in just a few weeks, and now he has to immediately leave. And so now he's writing to them. This is the, by the way, 1 Thessalonians was the very first book that Paul wrote, the first epistle that Paul wrote ever. So, this is the first book, the first letter that Paul wrote, and he writes it to these Thessalonians saying, saying, you've been saved, but I'm concerned about you now. I was only with you for three weeks, and I taught you a lot of things, and you really soaked it up, but now you need to go on uh, with the Lord in sanctification. You need to continue in your walk with the Lord. God needs to continue to help you in your walk. So, uh, he wants to establish them. If you look, we'll look at chapter 3, verse 13. He said, this is why he wrote the book. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he taught them so many things that he's able to continue that teaching with this book of 1 Thessalonians. So sanctification comes after we're saved, after conversion. Number two, sanctification has to do with our walk, with, uh, has to do with growing in our walk. Okay, chapter 1. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, I'm sorry, that we read. It says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. He wants them to grow now. So it has to do with growing in our walk. Look, if you will, at chapter 2, verse 12. He, he's writing to them that, they, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto uh, His kingdom and glory. Walk worthy of God. Chapter 4, verse 1 again says that so that ye might know how ye ought to walk and to please God. So sanctification has to do with our walk. Our walk. Now, if you're a Christian, you have a certain walk. We're not saved by works. But our good works help us in our Christian walk. You, you understand that, right? Our Christian walk, how we walk, how we live in front of other people, that's our Christian tested, that's our Christian walk. The Bible says we're not saved by good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. But then verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're supposed to walk in these good works. So, this uh, after we get saved, we should have a different walk. We should walk differently than we used to walk. So it has to do with how we walk now. Your walk will change once you become a Christian. Sanctification has to do with our walk. But sanctification also has is associated here in 1 Thessalonians with God's Word. How do, how do you change gradually as a Christian? How do you become more like Jesus? How are you more and more sanctified? Well, the Word of God has to be involved. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So how do you become more like Jesus? How are you going to be a sanctified vessel that's honoring and pleasing to God? Well, you have to get into the Word of God, don't you? The Word of God works in us. It works. It says it effectually worketh also in you that believe. So it involves the Word of God. Uh, the fourth thing is that sanctification, as we grow in the Lord, it brings assurance just like we sang about a few minutes ago blessed assurance it brings assurance 
It brings stability and it brings comfort. Look, if you will, at chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. He just had to leave them. He's saying, I'm concerned about you. I want the gospel of Christ to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith. In chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But, uh, oh, I, I skipped the assurance part. Chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So the gospel uh, has already come to them, and now he's wanting them to have assurance. He's talking to them about uh, being established and having that stability and comfort in your Christian life. If, you're, uh, if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if, if, the Lord's, if the Holy Spirit's not working in you to become Sanct, doing his sanctifying work, trying to help you to live a, a, a godly life, then you're probably not going to have that assurance in your heart about things. If you're a backslidden Christian, you're, you're a Christian, but you're not going to have assurance. You're going to be doubtful of things. So we need to get established. We need to have assurance. And the sanctifying work of God brings those things into, into our life. Okay, the next thing that sanctification does is found in chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 12. Sanctification allows us to grow not only in the other things we've seen, but it allows us to grow in our love for other, for other people. We start to love people differently than we did before. Chapter, four verses, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, I'm sorry. It says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts. So, uh, as God works in our lives, in our lives, our love for each other increases, and our love toward all men increases. So you'll, you'll start to, and that's, that's a sin, in, in 1 John, it says, that's a birthmark of a believer, that you have love one for another. You know, hereby may men know that ye know me, if you have love for the brethren, is what what, is what John says in one John. And so that's a that's a badge, or a it's and uh, Jesus even said that as well. Um, hereby will people know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. It's like a a symbol of our of our uh, faith. The, the love that we have is like a badge that says to other people who we are. We're 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 Christians, and so that should be part of it. Uh, the love that grows in our hearts for each other and for others. Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 as well. Uh, he again talks about this love. He says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we, be <coughs> we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. So we're growing in this love. He says it's a natural thing. When you become a Christian, nobody's going to have to tell you to love other Christians. It'll be a natural thing. God himself will teach you. You're supposed to love other Christians. You're supposed to love other people. And he says, you're already doing it, but I want to encourage you to do it more and more. Because the Thessalonians, they had heard about uh, the poor Christians over in Macedonia, and they had sent gifts over to the to help their other Christians. You know, we do the same thing. We send money to Armenian ministries, and we got a great letter from them this morning. We send money to other missionaries. But he says, that's great. You have a love for other Christians, but I want you to increase more and more. Keep growing in that love. And uh, hopefully our church can keep growing in that as well. But not only does it involve love for other people, sanctification involves holiness. We're called to holiness. And as we and we sang the song, more holiness give me. And that should be our prayer. You know, we should read through that song every once in a while as part of our devotions and 
Take each thing. Say, Lord, give me, help me to be more holy. Help me to be, help me to be more like Jesus. And it says that here in chapter 3, verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So we're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be holy. That's what the word means, really. That's what the word sanctification is talking about, really. We're set apart. We're holy for God. And there's all sorts of uh, uh, practical ways to be holy, given here in chapter 4. It, uh, there in, in verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. So we're supposed to abstain from fornication. There's, there's all sorts of terrible things going on all around the Thessalonians. So he's having to warn them. He's having to tell them uh, in a practical way. This, this is something you need to work at. The Lord needs to help you to, to stand out from the rest of the world. I was reading a little bit about Thessalonica. And this is a preacher named John MacArthur. He said the, the Thessalonians... He said Thessalonica was part of the debased Greco-Roman culture. The city was rife with sinful practices as fornication, adultery, homosexuality, including pedophilia, transvestitism, men dressing like women is what that is, and a variety of pornographic perversions, all done with a sacred, uh, I'm sorry, all done with a seared conscience and with society's acceptance, hence little or no accompanying guilt or shame. Sounds like modern day uh, UK, doesn't it? Uh, you know, the, the, all these things were going on without any conscience about it, all done with a seared conscience, all done with society's acceptance. There was no guilt or shame in the world about any of those things. And uh, so it was going on all around. It's going all around us as well. And so as a Christian, as, a sanctif as, sanctifica as vessels of sanctification, only the Holy Spirit can help us to live this sanctified life in the midst of this, this type of world. Uh, another guy says, a marked feature of life in the first century Roman Empire, and especially in, Thes in Greece, where Thessalonica was, was that they were lax about sexual sins. The Thessalonican church lived in a world where people did not see fornication as a sin, but as part of normal life. And in our day as well, it's just as part of normal life. We're the, we're the weird ones if we uh, try to live a holy life. But it, it says it featured also in the worship of some of the Thessalonican deities. And men in, gen men in general found it difficult uh, to feel deeply on the subject at all. Because Thessalonica was a seaport, there, was, there were many forms of prostitution and other forms of activity uh, that were presented as a con constant distraction or temptation for the recent converts. So these things had to be touched on by Paul. So they're facing all these things. They're just new Christians. But, but Paul says, I, I, I don't have to worry about you because the Holy Spirit's going to help you. To, to live a more holy life. He's going to help you to be sanctified. So he's, that's what he wants. He wants them to live a holy life. So sanctification has, it happens after we're saved. It has to do with our Christian walk. It's associated with God's Word. It brings assurance and stability in our Christian life. It, it, sanctification allows us to grow in our love for others. Sanctification involves holiness. And next is sanctification is God's will for every believer. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. We, all of us should want to please our Heavenly Father. Then in verse uh, 3, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So it's God's will for every believer. And uh, verse 4 says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, or which should be something that's part of every single one of our lives. Not only that, but sanctification involves our testimony, not just, it doesn't just involve our love for other people, it involves our testimony in front of the world. You're not going to be able to witness to people if you're living just like they are. They're not going to see any difference. 
So it involves our testimony to the world. And that's found in chapter 4, verse 12. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. That means the, pe the unsaved people on the outside. And that ye may have lack of nothing. So he says it involves our testimony. That we may, may walk honestly toward them with, that are without. And also in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, Now I exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that, ye, that none render evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So we're supposed to have a good testimony to all men, to everybody. And as we become more like Christ, our testimony grows, doesn't it? So sanctification involves our testimony to the world. Now this next point is very important. Chapter 4, verse 4. It says that every one of you may know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. If you'll put that verse, if you write next to that verse, if you write next to chapter 4, verse 4, if you write the reference for chapter 5, verse uh, 23. So, we're supposed to know how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, what is our vessel? What, what does it involve? Sanctification involves our whole being. Let's read chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. So it should involve our, sanctification involves our whole being. Not just our bodies that should be sanctified by living a holy life, but uh, our, our spirit, our soul, and our body should be sanctified. Now, when we get into, uh, in Bible doctrines, when we get to the study of man, we'll have a nice big chart to talk about the difference between the spirit, the soul, and the body, and we'll, and we'll talk about what all is involved. But just to give you a quick overview while we are touching on it tonight, you are not just a body. You are. You don't have a body, but you are, you're not a body. You are a spirit, and you have a body. That's, what, that's the way to say it. You are a spirit, and you have a body. That's your, your tabernacle, your tent, so to speak. So, you're a tripart being. Just like God, in chapter 1, uh, he, talked, he talked to them about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He talked to them about the Trinity. Well, God's a three-part. Well, God created us three-part beings as well. Spirit, soul, and body. So, it, in your spirit, uh, it's, your spirit's where God lives. Your spirit is where God dwells. Now, unsaved people, the Bible says they're spiritually dead. Okay? Unsaved people are spiritually dead. And the Bible, the Bible also says in Proverbs that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. That's a good illustration to picture it. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. An unsaved person, their candle is out. But when you, when you become a Christian, you become spiritually alive, your candle is lit, so to speak, and you are alive spiritually. That's your spirit. That's, where, that's how you have a relationship with God, in your spirit. But you also have a soul. It says that your whole spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit, when you get saved, your standing is, is fine. You're, you're spiritually, you are forgiven, you're seated with God in heavenly places already, but your but your soul and your body there's still there's still work to be done. Okay, your in your soul. Now sometimes in the Bible it, it uses the same word. It, it it uses spirit and soul interchangeably. So so you can't make it a fast rule. But there is a distinction made in other verses as well. Spirit, soul, and body. Your soul in your soul you have a conscience. Okay? In your soul, you have a conscience. In your soul, there's, there's a mind, emotion, and will. Okay? In, in your soul, you, you can think. In your soul, you can make decisions, your will. In your soul, you have emotions. And, uh, but all of those things are corrupted by sin. 
We can't make the right decisions. We can't have the right emotions. We can't uh, think the right way. Our mind's been tainted. But as, the, as we're saved, once we're saved spiritually, uh, our soul uh, can start to be sanctified. And the, God can start to work on us. And so uh, our mind, our emotions and will, the Holy Spirit can help us to be sanctified uh, in our whole being, spirit, soul, and body. But in our body, we have five senses. Those are like the gates into the soul. Some people say the eyes are the gateway into the soul. Well, we need to guard ourselves physically. We need to guard ourselves because in your body, you have these gates. We need to guard those gates, don't we? Because uh, through, through our eyes, what we see, it has an influence on our, on our soul. It has influence on us spiritually, what we see, what we allow in our eyes, what we allow... In our ears, in our body, we have those senses, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and we need to guard those things. And we need to ask the Lord to help us to be holy, to be sanctified. And so, uh, one day, we will be completely sanctified. Uh, one day, our body will be completely sanctified, it will be completely perfect, but until then, it's, it's a process. Until we get to heaven... We need to ask the Lord to help us. He says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You know, we're not going to get there completely until we see Jesus. But he says, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. That's when we'll be sanctified completely. We'll have a new body. We'll have a new uh, mind. We'll have everything will be perfect about us. You know, so it's all connected. So hopefully... I didn't confuse you too much talking about spirit, soul, and body, but just remember, you are not just a body. You are a three-part person, and we need the Lord's help with all of these, uh, in all these three different areas. Uh, sanctification involves, now this is, a, this is a bit of a warning, chapter 5, verses 6, verses six through 8. Sanctification involves watchfulness, not, not sleepiness, but soberness. Sanctification, we have to watch. Look at chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the light, night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. So we have to be careful. We have to watch. We have to be, watch for these things, or else it will never happen. And then the last point that is, uh, I already mentioned it a little bit before, but one day sanctification will culminate, it will be complete, will be sanctified completely at the coming of the Lord Jesus at His return. Chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which shall sleep in Jesus... Uh, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a that's a key passage for the second coming of, for the uh, the rapture of the church. And at that moment, you'll you'll have a new body. When Jesus comes again, you'll get a new body, and it'll be it'll you'll be completely sanctified, set apart for God for all of eternity. But until then, we should try to be set apart on the earth, as we uh, as God's left us here for a purpose. He wants to use you. As a, as a vessel of sanctification, just like he used those those vessels in the tabernacle. They used to be used for wicked things in Egypt, but God reshaped them, he gave them, they became new things, and he used that to, to as vessels of sanctification. He's made you, if you're a Christian, he's reshaped you, he's made you into a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things have become new, and he's created you in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. And uh, chapter 5, verse 23, again, it says, 
And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this, now look at verse 24, and we'll end with it. It says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. He's going to do it. And he set you apart. He'll, he who began a good work in you will, will complete it. He is going to finish it. And one day you'll, you'll be completely set apart. But let's pray that God will help us with all these things. I'll just read them once again. Uh, set, sanctification ha happens after you get saved. Sanctification has to do with growing in our walk with the Lord. Sanctification has to do uh, with, with reading God's Word and growing in God's Word. It has to do with having assurance, stability, and comfort in our Christian life. Sanctification allows us to grow in our love for others. Sanctification allows us to have a good testimony to the world and to have love for them as well. Sanctification has to do with holiness. Sanctification is God's will for every believer. Sanctification involves our whole being, spirit, soul, and body. And sanctification will one day culminate with Christ's return and will be completely sanctified, spirit, soul, and body for all of eternity. And that's something to look forward to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your sanctifying work in our lives. Father, I know it's a big word, but Father, I pray that everyone in this room who's a Christian will want to be more like Jesus. And Father, we, we know that's what, it's, that, that's what it's really about, this word sanctification. Help us to be more like you. Father, I pray that you'll help us to uh, have your, the Holy Spirit helping us to become more like Christ. Father, we pray that you'll do this wonderful work in our lives, each one of us tonight. And may we, may we be ready and willing for you to work in our hearts, even now. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who's not a Christian, that you will save them. And Father, I pray for all of us who are Christians that you'll help us to truly be set apart, holy, ready for you to use us in, each, in all the tasks that you have for each and every one of us as your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.